all over the building, and I want to ask Pastor Chuck Hyatt to come up here and open us with a word of prayer. How many glad to be saved, number one? And I'm glad to be saved, and I'm glad to be numbered among the redeemed and be able to have freedom. And you see all this American theme? You see all this American theme? That's not by accident. We, uh, we, we're patriotic here, and uh, we still thank God for America, and we thank God for President Trump. Somebody ought to help me. That'd ruin your day if you're a Democrat, but uh, probably not any in here. All right, come on up here, preacher. Love this man. Spent many, many years out in the state of Wyoming, and now came back, took his dad's church over here on 221. Now they're up Highway 110, and we love Brother Chuck Hyde. Brother Chuck, if you will, come over to send prayer, please, sir. Father, we love you. Thank you for this wonderful day you've given us, the opportunity to be in the house of God. Thank you for God's people. Lord, I'm glad that we can come together and worship the Lord this morning. Father, I pray that you'd have your way in the service. Give us wisdom. Help us to be sensitive to the spirit of the Lord. And God, I pray that you'd work in our hearts. Give us what we stand in need of. May Jesus Christ be glorified. Father, I pray if there's a sinner here that needs to be saved, God, save them this morning. Lord, we'll rejoice in all of your goodness and your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And remain standing, all right? Others are still coming in the doors. They're coming in from all directions. And here's what I want us to do. Go find your preacher. Tell them hello, and then tell them you're praying for them. We're going to sing in just a minute, all right? Cross the aisle, everybody. Cross the aisle. Everybody take a hymn and let's turn to page 354 as we stand, leaning on the everlasting arm.
page 488. 488, he keeps me singing. Here we go. All my life was wrecked by sin and strife. Discord filled my heart with pain. Jesus swept across a broken string, stirred the slumbering chords again. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. building. We're glad you're here. We're going to get a trio ready, and they're going to do one song for us, and then we're going to have our first preacher in just a moment or two. We're looking forward to hearing the men of God today that have driven in. Uh, most of them drove in. Uh, others will be coming this afternoon, and we appreciate every man of God being here. Right now, I want you to see the local support we're getting and what an encouragement it is. Uh, I mean, I'm looking out over this congregation and several men that are my friends and local pastors, and I want you pastors to know how much we appreciate very, very much the local men. So all of our men of God, evangelists, missionaries, pastors, uh, preachers, lay, whatever, I want all the men of God to stand, all right, all over the building for our first morning service, and uh, great, great numbers so far. Others will be coming in. All right, let's find out who everybody is because everybody doesn't know each other good and loud. All right, Brother Shane? God bless you, Brother Shane. God bless you. Amen. God bless you, Brother Mark. God bless you. Yes, sir. God bless you, brother. Now, that's, hold on now. now. See, you hear that English accent? Now, that means you came from England, right? And you're going back to England. That's great. God bless you. Tell the queen we said hello. Amen. <laughs> I'm just kidding. God bless you. I caught that accent. Go ahead, Brother Wampler. God bless you, Brother Wampler. God bless you, Brother Tim or Jeff. Did a great job last night opening this up for our Jubilee last night. God bless you. God bless you, Brother Rochester, right on the front. God bless your heart. Amen. God bless you. Brother from Jordan, how did you hear about the meeting? Great. Great. That's great. And we want everybody's address before you leave, okay? We want all you preachers' address. Go right ahead. God bless you. God bless you. Bless you, Brother Jack. God bless you, Brother Goodman. God bless your heart. 
God bless you. So good to have you. Appreciate everybody being here. Y'all ready? Come right along. We got one trio going to sing for us and different music through the week. Hope you enjoy all kinds. And may the Lord bless you while this trio sings. All right. The drunk on the street, the rich in their palaces, the poor and unlearned, and the men of degree, they all have a soul. song for about 30 years, but it doesn't get old, amen. I'm glad I'm a saved sinner, amen. Thank God for salvation. Appreciate it so much. We didn't recognize a dear brother to my right. I'm so sorry. I love him so much. It's Pastor Doug Rains coming down from the platform right now. He pastors the Progress Baptist Church in uh, Hendersonville, Fletcher, North Carolina. Thank you, Brother Doug, for being here. Brother Stroud, come on to the pulpit. We have three preachers to schedule this morning. Uh, Brother Stroud's going to start us off. Then Brother Barry Goodman, Pastor Barry Goodman, and then Brother Cody Zorn. The Lord willing, the Lord willing. 
Now, if he preaches for three hours, then we're only going to have one preacher, all right? <laughs> all right. God bless you, Brother Mark Stroud. You hear him well. All right. If you've got your Bible, open it with me to the book of Romans in chapter number eight. The book of Romans in chapter number eight. I appreciate the mercy of the pastor and letting me go first. Amen. And I told Brother Bear, I said, if you'll just tell me what outline you've got, I'll preach yours, praise God. And uh, he wouldn't give it to me. I don't know why. But uh, what a joy it is to be back at the Mountain View Baptist Church this morning. I appreciate it. I was sitting there, just, I just told Brother Nathan, I said, man, this place is packed with talent. And, man, just mix the groups and the choirs and all. And I've been praying that God touch the services these days. I appreciate the opportunity to be a part of the meeting with such men of God. And, uh, Brother Fuller, I'm still thinking about the messages that you preached last year on how to clean the house. And, uh, my goodness, that has spoke to my heart for a year. And I appreciate, aren't you glad for places you can go when you're not, when you just pull out of the parking lot, you're not leaving what you got, but it goes with you. And I, I appreciate that. And I'm looking forward to hearing these other men of God preach. Brother Trey, I tell you what I want you to do, and I mean this. I want you to put it on your clock. I'm going to preach 30 minutes. And then I'm going to quit. I'm, going to, I'm telling you, because if I get happy, I will preach 30 hours. Amen. But I mean it. When I get started, you, you just wave at me. I mean, you preach at the Taylorsville camp meeting. They've got a red light in the back of the building. And if you're the first preacher, you've got about a 30-minute time frame. And you see it, it goes from green to yellow to red. And whether you're done or whether you're not, when that red light hits, you're done, praise God. And, uh, and I thought preaching first was bad. But uh, then I had to follow Mike Bagwell for three nights, and I wished I could have preached first. Amen. I told Brother Dagenhart, I said, I don't know where you come from, but Sunday school comes before preaching. I should get to preach before Brother Bagwell. Amen. All right, Romans chapter number 8. Let's stand together. Preacher, thank you for letting me be here this morning. I love the Mountain View Baptist Church. Romans chapter number 8 and verse number 23. The Bible said, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, by, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. You can be seated. Hope we keep your Bible open and we'll get as far as we can this morning. But when you walk into the verses of Romans chapter number 8, you find yourself in one of the deepest treasure chests uh, that's contained in uh, the Word of God. How uh, you think about the children's eyes on Christmas morning uh, when they walk to the Christmas tree and all the presents are arrayed under that tree. Boy, their eyes light up. And can you imagine what it would be for a treasure hunter? All these programs you have, everybody's looking for gold and a, and a hidden treasure. How their faces light up when they find what they're looking for. Uh, can I tell you as a child of God, uh, that ought to be the reaction when we make our way uh, into Romans chapter number 8. Uh, uh, for the child of God, Romans 8 is the declaration of independence or the declaration of dependence on the Son of God. Uh, Martin Luther said that Romans 8 uh, was the masterpiece of uh, the New Testament. Uh, Romans 8 is the conclusion uh, to Romans 6, 1, 16 where it said uh, uh, that we are not ashamed of the gospel uh, uh, for it is the power of God unto salvation uh, uh, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Amen. Uh, I mean, thank God it tells us why uh, that we don't have to be ashamed of uh, uh, we're living in a day where men want to drop their colors. Uh, uh, they want to change their road they're going on. Uh, uh, but can I stand and say today, uh, I'm so glad that I'm a child uh, of the family of God. Uh, I've been washed in his blood, uh, added to the family of God. I'm not ashamed uh, of this Bible we preach out of. Uh, I'm not ashamed of the way we go to worship. Uh, I'm not ashamed of how we conduct ourselves. I'm not looking for a new way. Uh, I'm not looking for a new message 
message. I'm just looking for the help of God not to dip my colors in the day in which we're living in. Up until this point in Romans 1 through 7, he's dealing with sin and he's dealing with self and he's dealing with Satan. But thank God when you mark your way into Romans 8, it's no longer sin. It's no longer self and it's no longer Satan. But boy, you find the word spirit over 19 times in Romans 8. Aren't you glad for the glad hour when God birthed you into the family of God and the spirit of God came to reside in your heart. Boy, we've come a long way from Romans 1 where everybody's under condemnation to listen, nobody has to be under condemnation. We've gone from an accusation that's just to a justification that's perfect. We've gone from man's unrighteousness to God's perfect righteousness. We've gone from a mouth that was silenced because of the shame of sin to a mouth that's wide open, exalting the grace of a God Almighty. Can I tell you, you come into Romans 8 and you find that there's no condemnation to destroy. But before you walk out of Romans 8, you find there's no separation to divide. Happy day, happy day when you realize as a child of God, there's nothing in the earth above the earth or below the earth that can separate you from the love of God. Somebody please tell me how a saved man is going to become a lost man when he cannot be divided from the love of God Almighty. Amen. Amen. You look in Romans 8 in these first verses, you find that there's a new law. He said in verse 2, the law of the Spirit. Amen, friend. The law of the Spirit. And the first thing he says about this new law is there's no more condemnation of sin. You're talking about one of the most hopeful verses uh, that's recorded in the Word of God. He said, there is now therefore uh, no condemnation to them uh, uh, which are in uh, Christ uh, Jesus. Uh, I'm talking about there's some hope in that verse. Uh, I tell you, before the law of the Spirit, uh, uh, the Bible said it's a law of sin, but we got all love preaching and all grace preaching. Uh, we need to swing the pendulum back a little bit and preach a little bit of the law. You say, well, is the law of sin? God forbid. Uh, he he said, I'd not known sin had it not been for the law. Uh, but I'm thankful to God uh, that the law dropped me off at the doorstep of grace. Uh, and what the law could not do, uh, I'm glad there was a heavenly Boaz uh, that could graft me into the family of God. Uh, he said, there's no more condemnation uh, than to them which are in Christ Jesus. That phrase, in Christ Jesus, one of Paul's favorites. It's recorded in every book that he wrote. Uh, aren't you glad that you got in him? And he got in you. Verse 10 says uh, uh, that he's in you. Uh, and he said there's no condemnation. i tell you what we ought to do in 2021. Uh, uh, we ought to put our right foot on now and our left foot on no. Uh, and thank God walk on as a child of God. Uh, because we have been forgiven uh, of the drunk on the street. Uh, of the harlot in the ditch. Uh, that's what we used to be. Uh, until the good grace of God uh, came to where we were and saved us by his marvelous grace. It's hard to really understand that in Christ Jesus. Man, I, I feel sorry for these hyper-dispensationalist boys. And I know there's this, I'm not criticizing the discipline. I'm just talking about when men want to dismiss the whole Old Testament of the Word of God. You can, keep, you can study it and keep it in its right dispensation. Can I get a witness, Brother Joy? Amen. But I tell you, the, I thought it said all scripture. It didn't see the Pauline epistles. It said all scripture. Amen. I'm glad, I'm glad Brother Fuller, Job had a, had a Bible, praise God. Amen. Amen. And if it could help Job, don't you think it might could help you? Amen, friend. You say, what is that in the Christ Jesus? Well, probably going to have to go back to Noah and the ark to really understand all that it means to be in 
Christ Jesus. That Bible said when that ark was completed, I'm talking about that perfect way of escape from the divine wrath of God. Uh, oh, you know what it did? He said, uh, uh, the Lord said, come thou and thy family in uh, to the ark. And the Bible said that God shut the door. I tell you what, I'm glad, thank God, the hypercalvists can't shut the door. He's the one, that, he's the one uh, uh, that controls the door. And he said, I set before you an open door which no man can shut. Aren't you glad uh, uh, that when you got on the Holy Ghost conviction, uh, uh, there was an open door. Uh, but he said, come in. Uh, and the Lord shut him in. Uh, can I tell you, he didn't tell Noah and his family members to drive eight stakes uh, on the outside of the ark uh, and they'd be saved if they could hold on. Uh, oh, no, friend. Uh, he said, come on. Uh, and then listen, between Noah and his family uh, and the judgment of God uh, uh, was wood that had been hewn out uh, and pitched within and without. Uh, uh, did that word pitch say where we get atonement? Uh, uh, you say where do we get atonement from? Uh, uh, there was two pieces of hewn wood uh, uh, where they hung the lovely Lord Jesus. Uh, and can I tell you the reason? Uh, I'm going to make it tonight uh, uh, because between me and the judgment of God uh, is the pitch. Uh, it's been pitched within uh, and it's been pitched without. Uh, uh, there's something between me and the judgment of God and it's name is Jesus. Amen. There's no more condemnation to sin. He said there's a new law in town. Verse 5 through 7 said there's a new Lord in town. Amen. I'm talking about a new Lord, that spirit of God that moved in. Amen. We're living in weak Christian days when somebody needs a bracelet to tell them to live right. If the Holy Ghost in you is not big enough to correct you, you didn't meet the one that I met. Amen. There's times, there are times when words are coming out of my mouth before they ever reach my tongue uh, to the ears of the hearer, the Holy Ghost that's in me is already telling me all to repent. I've not even got it good and said yet, and the Lord's already telling me to repent. Amen. There's a new, a new Lord. He'll, he listen, praise God. He's controlling our mind in verse 5 through 7. He's controlling our motives in 8 and 9. But thank God he still can control our members in verse 10 through 13. Amen. A new Lord. A new law. But boy, in the end parts of these verses, there's a new life. There's a new life. I think about that position of our sonship. He said, we have not received the spirit of bondage, uh, but we've been sent the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The preciousness of our sonship. Amen. Amen. My dad passed away back in December, 12 days before my mom did. But you guess what? I'm still his boy. And if you mess with me, he might come back from heaven and whoop the fire out of you. Amen. I don't know. But boy, I'm telling you what. There's a world in between us, but the preciousness of the fact that I'm still his son and he's still my father lives on in my heart, amen. But not only that preciousness of the sonship, but then there's the promise of security, verse 28 through 39. Can I tell you if there was something I could do to separate me from the love of God, I would do it. I could do it, but thank God, hallelujah. I'm glad he put me so far in 34 years ago. I couldn't find my way out if I wanted to, amen. Boy, if you would have, if you would have gone some years ago down to Haiti and we would have been walking through a little Cape Haitian orphanage, you would have been looking for a little girl by the name of Karenet. She was one of the 57 orphans that were housed in this little orphanage. You'd have had a hard time picking her out because she looked much like the rest of the children. But uh, and listen, she, she ate the same rice and beans that the rest of those orphans ate. 
She slept in the same metal beds that the rest of those orphans slept in. She slept under a tin roof uh, just like the other 56 orphans that were contained uh, there in that orphanage. They listened to that Haitian rain uh, beat down on that, on, that metal, uh, on that metal roof at night so it was so loud they could barely sleep. But if you'd have looked closely, you'd have understood there was something different about that little girl, Karenette, than all of the other orphans. You say what it was. Well, Karenette, even though she was in that orphanage, she was living in a different world. You say, what kind of world was it? Well, it was a world to be. You say, what do you mean? Because there was something different about Karenette. She had been adopted. She had been adopted. Her parents, her, her prospective parents, and her adopted parents had came and done everything that was necessary to adopt her. And they brought her four things. They brought her a teddy bear. They bought her a photo book. And they bought her some granola bars. And they brought her some cookies. The first thing Karenette did was she gave her cookies and the granola bars to the rest of the children and she took her teddy bear to the, uh, to the mistress of the orphanage and asked her to please uh, take care of the teddy bear. She didn't want it to get gone. But there was one thing that she was unwilling to part with. She would not part with that little photo book. And if you'd have found that little Karenette, you could have asked her to see her pictures and she would have been happy to let you see them. Matter of fact, if you didn't ask her to see her pictures, she would have said, would you like to see my pictures? You say, well, I, uh, what was so important about those pictures? Well, when you flip that front cover up uh, uh, to that little photo album, who you would have saw would have been little Karenette's adopted father and is her adopted mother and her adopted brothers and sisters. And can I tell you the same place that Karen it was? Her situation is much like yours and mine because they said every time that gate would swing open in that little Haitian orphanage, he said that little heart of that little girl about beat out of her chest because she thought every time the gate swung open that her dad had came back to finally take her to her new home. Amen. And can I tell you, does that not sound familiar? Uh, you and I have been adopted into a family. Uh, and thank God, let me ask you, how long's it been since you took your picture book uh, and you said, somebody, uh, uh, look at my pictures. Uh, uh, look at who my father is. Uh, uh, look at who my brothers are. Uh, uh, look at where my home is. Uh, aren't you glad? Thank God. Uh, uh, we've got some things to cause us. Uh, uh, I want to look for our family. Uh, uh, but thank God you're just in that same situation. Uh, listen, we've been adopted, uh, but we've just not been claimed yet. Amen. Uh, can I tell you, listen, uh, according to Romans 8, 29 and verse 30, uh, long before you ever knew you needed to be adopted, uh, he already signed the paperwork. Uh, I mean, thank God, uh, Karen did not pay for her adoption, uh, but according to the book of Galatians, uh, our adoption has been paid for, uh, and the documents have been signed and all we are doing is waiting on the, arrival, on the arrival of our adopted father. Amen. Amen. You know what? You don't finance your adoption. You just accept it. Amen. You couldn't pay for it if it did. Amen. You know this. The Lord has no grandchildren or stepchildren. The moment you get saved, you become an heir and a child of God. What he gets, you get. Glory. Do you know it is law in the state of Georgia that you cannot disinherit an adopted child? Where do you think they got that at? Glory to God. Amen, friend. Can I tell you, we have been adopted we're just waiting to be transported. We have a new family. We just hadn't got to our new house yet. Can I get a witness? We know our father's name, but we've only seen his face in the pictures. Amen, friend. He claimed us. He just hasn't come for us yet. And can I say to you, say, where are you getting back to Romans 8 with it? Just hold on. I'm going there. Can I tell you this? Our problem is we are living 
between the what is and the what will be. We're living in the nasty now and now, looking for the hope of the sweet by and by. Can I tell you, when I stood at the bedside of my dad at uh, that Sunday morning about 9.50, I remember when the Lord came that morning about 8 o'clock. He came about 8 o'clock, and I called my, my wife, and I called my sister. I said, y'all better come if you're going to see him. They said, have you heard from the doctor? I said, no, but I just heard from the Lord. They said, what do you mean? I said, the Lord just came, and I said, when he leaves, Dad's leaving with him. And I got up there, and I got to singing, there's a land that is fairer than day. And by faith, we can see it afar, for my Father waits over the way to prepare a dwelling place there. And can I tell you, I sang that. I sung, I'll meet you in the morning. I sung, what a day that'll be. You say, why? I was caught between the nasty now and now, but I was looking to the sweet by and by. And that's exactly where that little orphan was. But she was caught living in that little orphanage, eating rice and beans. And how many times do we get too used to the rice and beans? beans of this world and to the tin plates of this world and to the tin roofs of this world. How long's it been since you looked in your picture book to see where we're going? Amen. Question is, if we're living between what, the what is and the what will be, what do we do in the meantime? And can I tell you, sometimes it really is a meantime. You say, what do you mean? COVID, chemotherapy, divorce, broken hearts, the falling of our heroes. I mean, some of the things that go on in our life that make me think sometimes that I bought a timeshare in Afghanistan, praise God. Amen. I mean, man, sometimes things come that break our heart. And man, it makes me look, man, I'm looking more to the return of the Lord than I ever have been. Uh, but we're living in what is. And what do we do between what is? And that's what we see in Romans 8. I want to preach just a, how many minutes, brother? I'll preach the first point and I'll be done. How many minutes? Tell me the truth. I got 10 minutes. Praise God. I'm not built for speed. Brother Cody's slim and, and I'm built for, he's built for speed. I'm built for pulling. Amen. <laughs> Amen. If you need to pick up a car outside, I can help you now. Amen. What do you do in the meantime? Let me just say, number one, it's all in Romans 8. Can I say, look at verse 14 through 17. What do we do in the meantime? Well, we rest in the position that we've received from our Father. Look at what it said in verse 15. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Oh, my one of the greatest evidences that I belong to him is there is an unseen hand that guides my way. Amen. This morning, this morning I, I rolled through a stop sign at home just in the middle of nowhere. We don't even have, we got one red light in our town. But I rolled through the stop sign. And guess what? I got lit up by the police. They said, you get angry? I thought, no, because I did what he said I did. But I thought there and I sat there and said, Lord, I don't know what you're keeping me from. Maybe there's something up the road. I said, but I ain't going to fight it. I'm not going to be ugly and mean. Aren't you glad you got somebody that can put things in your life to steer you? Hey, listen, for the, for, the, for the Old Testament, for the nation of Israel, it was a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. But can I tell you, I'm glad I don't have to go out and look for a cloud or look for a fire. But I'm glad this morning, about 5 o'clock, when I rolled out of the bed, I laid a Bible open, Brother Fallure, and a boy, that hand started walking and guiding my heart and guiding my mind. Thank God, Brother John, there's a word in this nasty now and now. I'm glad as a child of God I don't have to run to a poop I don't have to run to a room but I can bow my head to God and that word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path I'm glad there is the leading of the spirit but then verse 15 there's the loving of the father the loving of the father I like it old song I was sinking deep in sin Far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, seeking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, and from the waters lifted me, now safe 
am I? If you're going to heaven, it's because love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help. He said he's not giving us a spirit of bondage, but a spirit of rights whereby we cry, Abba, Father. If you're going to have to understand what he's talking about, you need to understand a little bit about Roman adoption. There was something called that the, 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 the father's law, the law of patria in, in that Roman law where the father always had to say that son in Rome was never the man until the father died. He always had the word. And man, and because of that, power, that power of the father in that Roman culture, adoption was a very difficult thing. But there was two things that you had to go to. The first one was called mancipatio. And let's say Brother Kyle was going to adopt my son and uh, we would go to a place where there would be witnesses and uh, there would be a balanced scale and there would be copper. And two times, Brother Kyle, you would, uh, you would put that, uh, you would, I would say, well, I'm going to adopt your son. And then two times you would put copper on that scale to say that you were buying him back. But on the third time, we put that son up for sale and you would not redeem your son. And what that was saying, that the law of the father was being broken. I'm telling you at Calvary 2,000 years ago, uh, the law of our other father was broken. Uh, uh, the power of the devil uh, uh, was broken in our life. Uh, and when that power of the father uh, uh, was broken, the other father uh, could, uh, he was being emancipated. I want to thank God uh, uh, for the Sunday morning as a third year old boy uh, when I got emancipated from sin I got emancipated from the family of hell I got emancipated uh, from a lost past to a prospective future but then the second part was called vindicatio where that father that was adopted would have a lawyer or a representative that would take his legal case to a judge and they would plead the case and the judge would make a ruling that, Brother Kyle, you, you could adopt my boy. Oh, my. Sound like the son. He said, touch me not, for I have not yet ascended. There was work to be done. There was blood to be put on the mercy seat. And can I tell you, when the father, listen, it wasn't about Calvary. It wasn't about pleasing us. And Calvary was not about pleasing hell. But Isaiah 53 said it pleased the father to bruise it. And thank God because the judge was appeased. Because our sin had been paid for. You and I could be adopted in the family of God. They said about that adoption. Said the first thing that happened was that you lost all the rights in your old family. But at the same moment that you lost all the rights into your old family, you gained all the rights into your new family. Ah, that I'm no longer a child of hell, uh, but I'm a child of the living God uh, with all right, what do they say at graduation, commencement services, and with all the rights and privileges uh, uh, that are afforded. I'm glad, thank God, uh, uh, when I got born to get, he didn't wait to see if I panned out. Uh, he didn't wait to see if I'd surrender to preach. Uh, uh, but when I got born again, uh, I was endowed with the rights and the privileges of a son of God. Amen. You got saved and got adopted. That new son got a new inheritance. And do you know, it didn't matter how many children were born into the family, that son's inheritance never changed. Here's the kicker to me, the third one. They said when a child got adopted, they said the past of his previous life was totally erased just think if that boy had had trouble that, if that boy had, had had a hard life and made some mistakes and uh, boy that father realized I can't do anything else to help him and his life is going to be forever marked because of the failures but when he got adopted that whole record that whole record I like that old song said I remember the day when I was bowed low from the burden of sin and strife, then Jesus came in and he rescued me and he gave me a brand new life. 
And now as I thank him day after day for washing my sins away, it seems I can almost hear the voice of the blessed Savior say, what sins are you talking about? I don't remember them anymore. From the book of life, they've all been torn out. I don't remember them anymore. I don't know about you. Maybe I'm the only one happy in here. I've got a past I don't want anybody to know about. Hey, I didn't get out the way they did see him, but there were some things I did or that my mom and dad died and never knew that I'd done, and I'm glad it's that way. But thank God when I got born again, I'm glad the guilt of my past does not have to follow me anymore because when I got adopted in the son, I became a son and got adopted into the family. My past was a race. I'm done, preacher. Come on. Amen. I'll just give you these other two points. I'll just give them to you. How do we live in the meantime? You rest in the position we've received as a father, and then you remember the prospects we have reckoned for the future. Oh, my. And we rejoice by the person who rescues us from our failures. It's all in there, praise God. Amen. Amen. Thank you, preacher. I think a good hearty amen goes right there. We are rich. I've said this a lot. We are rich beyond a miser's dream. Spiritually, all right? Spiritually, we are rich beyond a miser's dream. All right, Brother Cam's going to come and give us a good song. We're going to have our second preacher in just a little bit. Others have came in. We're glad you're here. May the Lord minister and bless every heart that's in attendance today. And thank you so much for being attentive to the Word of God. Thank you, Brother Stroud driving all the way up here, getting up at 5 a.m. In, in this morning, making the journey and the trip. And we appreciate God's man. We do. Listen to this great song, all right? I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or land. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hand than to be the king of a vast domain or be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have my Jesus than anything this whole world affords today. I'd rather have Jesus than men's applause. I'd rather be faithful to his dear cause. I'd rather have Jesus than worldwide fame. I'd rather be true to his holy name than to be Jesus than anything this whole world affords today. Oh, he's fairer 
than the lilies of rarest bloom. He's sweeter than the honey from out of the comb. Oh, he's all that my hungering spirit needs. I'd rather have Jesus and let him lead than to be the king of Jesus than anything this old world affords today. Amen. Amen. Great, great song. Amen. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. You know what uh, blesses me about Jubilee? is uh, the different men that you have in. And I'm glad that all preachers are not the same. If, if we were all the same, that'd be kind of boring, amen? But we're all different, and God uses each one in the way that he so chooses. And we praise the Lord for all of you men. Thank you for being here. Our next preacher is Pastor Barry Goodman. He pastors the Faith Baptist Church in Shelby, North Carolina. Great, great supporter of our Christian school. And I've uh, been here, I'd say, Brother Barry, you've been up there about maybe 20, 30 years? 34. Wow, that's great. 34 years in one church, Shelby, North Carolina. Hear him well as he preaches to us, all right? Amen. Thank you, preacher. God bless your heart. Amen. Praise God. Amen. That's what? Water. Do you have any NyQuil? <laughs> It'll work when nothing else will. It's cured everything. It's, it scared COVID off of me. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. They say, well, does it really heal you? No, but you don't care. Amen. amen, amen. Praise God. I like get I like getting older. I, I'm looking around. I think I think I've attained. I'm probably the oldest preacher here again. That's the way it goes until David Epps gets here. <laughs> amen. Praise God. I said, please preach Thursday morning. Oh, no, I'm not coming into Friday. I said, well, I wish you'd come Thursday. He said, he said, well, you just wanted to hear me. I said, no, I wanted you to be the oldest preacher. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Wasn't that great? Yeah. Brother Mark, God bless you. you <laughs> oh, my dear friend, thank you so much, Brother Steve. Let me come. I love this place. I'm glad it's been a bastion for the old-time religion for many years and its predecessor uh, pastorates through the years. Brother Robbins was a blessing. And, but I thank God for this man that hasn't changed. Stayed with it. Stayed with it. Did, hey, thank, didn't change roads. Hallelujah. I've seen enough of that. I'm sick of that mess. Amen. Amen. Praise God. And, uh, and I appreciate the play. Appreciate the good friend. Appreciate y'all having the school. I pray for you. Thank God for you. I'll sit there at the Waffle House enjoying my breakfast and just pastoring a church. And I, and I sit there and I saw them kids going to school and I wave at them. I said, go down there, go down there. Y'all go down there. Let's go, let their parents cuss them out. Go ahead, go on down there. Y'all go on down there and let them get mad. Go on down there. Go on down there. I'll come watch you play ball. Hey, Amen. I, lo I love seeing him get ulcers and go to the hospital with his heart. Hey, amen, hey, amen, hey, amen. But the trouble is I got the same heart problem he does because I pastored a principal. I was a principal two years in the state of Georgia, hey, amen, when Georgia was Georgia. But anyway, <laughs> before it was Stacey Abrams' land, hey, amen. Hey, amen. Y'all holding on to North Georgia, ain't you? Hey, amen. And, but my dear friend done me such a wonderful favor. Puts me between Mark Stroud and Cody Zorn. It's all right, me, praise God. I recommend, I, I represent the dementia crowd. The old timers, amen. Uh, open your Bibles. Anywhere you want to. 
I plan just to find me a place and just keep rolling until I hit a nerve, amen. I'm like a chiropractor, just keep pressing till they scream, amen. All right, amen. Open your Bible, please. Second Timothy. Second Timothy, chapter number four. Amen. <laughs> I noticed, Brother Mark, I love you, son. He said, Cody was built for speed. <laughs> uh, amen. I'm built for the rest of them. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Uh, I was looking the other day, they were talking this year, they were talking about the economy, the economy, the economy. And I was in meeting and I was in the hotel getting dressed, getting ready to meet the preacher. And I looked in the mirror. I had my trousers on and my T-shirt, and I just finished shaving. And I went to, <laughs> looked at my, my head, and I looked in the mirror on TV, the, the economy today. I said, Goodman, you are an economy. Yeah. Brother Chuck, I said, my hair is in recession. Yeah. My stomach is a victim of inflation. Yeah. And the combination of these two factors is leading me to a great depression. Yeah. Amen. And then to make it worse, they come on and they showed Biden. And then I just started to shoot myself. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Second Timothy. Second Timothy, chapter number four. Right. And I'll begin reading verse number 10. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Crescens to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable. Boy, that'll preach to me for the ministry. Look at verse 16. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that he may not lay it to their charge. Flip over to Hebrews, just a few pages over. Chapter number 12 and verse number 27, well, verse 26, whose voice, talking about the Lord's voice, the Lord Jesus, who is much better than the angels and the prophets. Here we go, here we go. Whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying it once more, I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word yet once more signified the removing of those things which are shaken as of things that are made that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Go with me to the Revelation. Chapter number three, the Lord speaking his final message to the seven churches. You could say collectively to the church of all the ages. And he said, be watchful, verse number two, and strengthen the things that remain that are ready to die. I want to preach for a little while just on the thought of remaining. I want to preach to you on remaining. Webster said, Dan Webster in his 1828 dictionary where he quotes many times from the 1611 King James Bible. I like that dictionary. It might be 1828, but I call it the 1611 version of the dictionaries. Amen. He says that remaining means to be left alone while others have withdrawn. I want to preach on remaining. I want to say Paul was alone. Paul is coming in this last chapter as he's getting ready to lay his life down. They say that he literally, the church tradition, that he broke away from his captors and ran and voluntarily with glee and delight laid his neck across there where they could cut his head off. And as he's writing his final farewell, he said, I'm alone. Only Luke is with me. And I want to say, thank God he was alone. Let me tell you why he was alone. Because in a day of political aggression, in a day of political suppression, 
in a day of, of confusion, in a day of spiritual compromise and corruption. He remained true to the word of God that was given to him and summoned unto him by the high sheriff of heaven. I want to say to you in these days of compromise, in these days of corruption, in these days of confusion, I want to say we need saints. Thank God that we'll remain. We need servants of God that will remain true to the word of God. We need remaining, not retreating. We need remaining, not recovering. I say we need remaining, not recovering. We need remaining, not ranting at those that refuse to recover. We need remaining, not rebelling. We need remaining, not revising. I want to say the objective, dear friend, is to stay true to the word of God. Stay true to our calling. Stay true to the fundamentals of the faith. Stay true to the earnestly contending for the faith and the word of God. I want to tell you, at last, when the world's on fire, the truth will still be standing. Let them rage. Let them rant. Let them cuss. Let them compromise. We're not backing up. I want to say to you, to remain today, if you're going to remain as the Apostle Paul, and I, I would be unworthy to either touch his shoe latchet, but I want to say, Brother Wampler, to remain true, it's going to require an affirmation. It's going to require an affirmation. Paul said, nevertheless, I suffer these things, for I know whom I have believed. I know it don't matter. Let them go ahead and cuss. Let them go ahead and criticize. Let them go ahead and make fun of videos. Praise God, I like the videos. Somebody said the other day, said you got a video of you out. I said, good. At my age, I can't remember what I said. I hope they got it right. Hey man, let them go ahead and make fun of the old time way. Let them make fun of the gray headed. Hey, hey, may I say, let them go ahead and make fun uh, of what they want to make fun of. Praise God, it's not a personal fight, no how. Hey, when you can't attack a position, you attack the person. Somebody, they learned well from the Democrats and the woke crowd. Somebody help me. May I say to you, if, you, if you're going to stand and remain today, you're going to have to believe it. You're going to have to believe it. I say you're going to have to believe it and behave it. I needed a little anointing there. You're going to have to believe it. You know why so many have, you know why so many are departing and changing lanes? They never believed it to start with. They went along with the crowd. They loved the car. They loved the model. They loved the ride. But it never was in their heart. John said, had they been of us, John said, had they been of us, they would have no doubt continued with us. But they left us that they might be manifest that they were not of us. You can't recover from anything you never had. I want to say to you, bless this holy name. You've got to believe it. You've got to behave it. May I say the old time religion and the old time way. I hear folks say, y'all just keep harping about that old time religion. I'll tell you why. Praise God, it's what saved me from the pits of sin. It's what sent the Savior down my road one day when I was a lost sinner on my way to the devil's hell and reached down in the pit where I was. It's the old time way. May I say, old time religion, I'm tired of letting the enemy and letting the world define what we are and what we used to be. We owe it to the Harold Sattlers. We owe it to the Jimmy Robbins. We owe it to the Mays Jacksons. We owe it to the Billy Kellys to keep preaching the same Bible and keep, somebody help me. I want to say to you, it's more than just a memory. Well, I remember them days. I remember them old time days. What do you mean you just remembered them? It's like, quit remembering them. Let's remain in them. It's more than a memory. It's more than a movement. Oh, that was just a movement. That was popular in the 60s. Oh, no, bless God. It's more than a memory. It's more than a movement. It's a message. It's a message. 
It's a message. Somebody said, what is the old time religion? Say what it is. Y'all ready? You ready? It's everything in between those covers. And it's not anything that's not in those covers. I want to say it's a message. It's a mandate. It's a message. And the primary message is, and I agree, Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Wafted on the rolling tide. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Tell the nations far and wide, Brother Chuck, Jesus saves. Jesus saves. I'm glad for the day that I heard there is a fountain filled with blood. Jesus saves. Oh, thank God. Hey, it's not a style. The old time religion is not a style. It's scriptural. It's what's inside these pages. Hey, may I say to you, this is not something. The old time religion, preaching, singing, shouting, proclaiming the gospel. Hey, may I say to you, standing on it, believing it, not retreating from it. It's not just shouting it out. It's preaching and singing. This is not something we do. It's what we are. You got to believe in it. You can't just pretend it and go along with it. They're trying to say, well, well, yeah, no, we this is the remaining crowd. Uh, amen. Hey, hey, stand against societal change. Stand against social corruption. I ain't, listen, this crowd of new fundamentalist crowd that's wanting to accommodate the world and the woke and the BLM. I, I believe in BLM. Belt loops matter. Think on that a while. Trying to accommodate and trying to find places in their churches for the homosexual crowd. It's amazing to me when a fellow comes out or a woman comes out, they find a place in these new churches that's taken Baptist off their sign. It's, it's strange to me, it's strange to me, it's strange to me, internet's hot right now, it's strange to me that they accommodate the homosexual crowd. A homosexual is welcome at Faith Baptist Church to hear the gospel. But if they don't get saved, they ain't hanging around here. Somebody help me. And this new sexual, binary, whatever it is, binary. Amen. The other day they come out and said, it's, it's not babies anymore. It's babies. T-H-E-Y. Babies. So, so Poindexter Dexter and Frankie, that's two men, two boys, whatever they are, uh, amen. I, I, it's probably good that they have them reveal parties for babies now because the poor doctors wouldn't know what to do. In my day, even when my oldest son was born, we didn't know it was a boy until they come out. Praise God, that's the way God done it. Amen. But can't you see the doctor coming out and say, here, sir, it's a brand new baby boy. Here, sir, it's a brand new baby girl. Uh, sir, we don't know what it is yet. It, it is a TBD, to be determined. <laughs> Let me tell you, this crowd, oh my goodness, I better not walk around there and think I'm targeting somebody. This crowd, this crowd, it says, this crowd say, it's the, to me it's the depths of blasphemy to say, I don't like what God made me to be. You mean you sorry, no down, scandalous, ingrate, telling the creature, telling the creator, you don't like the way he made you? You are the depths of blasphemy. I'm a, I'm a man trapped in a woman's body. Well, I was too till mama had me. We're standing against societal change. We're standing against social change. We're standing against spiritual compromise. Why? We still believe in preaching the word. Be it 
in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering. Thank God for preachers that still with compassion and with love, but unashamedly, unequivocally, no matter who it is, tell the truth. You know what they want to characterize us? And this leads me to the second point. It requires an affirmation if you're going to remain, but it also re it reveals an identification. Yeah. Amen. I'm going to tell you what, if you're going to remain, you're going to have to be willing to be identified with the old-fashioned crowd. I mean the old-time religion, old-fashioned King James Bible preaching, singing, shouting, slobber, slinging, spitting, soul winning. Hallelujah. Don't care, like it, lump it, jump it, bump it, whatever. Uh, amen. They say, they say y'all just against everything. Let me tell you something. You got it all wrong. We're against some things because of what we're for and start with. I want to say I am for the Bible. I am, I am for the King James Bible. I am for the Lord Jesus Christ. I do believe in the church. Amen. With the sign out front. With a Baptist sign out front. I do believe in traditional biblical marriage. I am for unborn babies. I am for the Star Spangled Banner. Jose is welcome to come to America as long as he learns to sing. Jose, can you see? Yeah. Amen. I am for uh, Charlotte the other day. Ashborough, Ashborough, a boy graduated and uh, he put on a Mexican flag, wrapped it around his graduation garb, and they, they start, they're all upset because the school wouldn't let him have his diploma. Not because he wore a Mexican flag. You're supposed to wear no flag. Well, bless God, if you ain't going to let them wear an American flag, sure don't let them wear another nation's flag and get a diploma from the United States. And before you call us a racist and all that, uh, amen, I want to say the director right there, our field director of our Philippine mission, amen, how many churches? 25 churches. How many preachers? Amen. Praise God. May I say to you, uh, brown-skinned folks in another nation, amen. But I want to say to you, praise God, if you want to come to America, come here right and be right when you stay, get stay here. And pay your bills. Amen. <laughs> Woo, y'all all right. Some of you look a little pale, amen. Hey. hey no, I ain't got to worry about this crowd, amen. Uh, amen. I am for the Second Amendment because it protects all the rest of them. Amen. Yeah. Hey man. Yeah. Hey man. Say, I don't like you. <laughs> yeah, when I'm 68 and able to stand up and talk. You think I'm worried about whether you like me or not? Yeah. Hey man. Hey, I am for secure borders. Yeah. Hey man. I'm still for President Trump. Yeah. I still have the sign in my front yard. Amen, amen. May I say to you, it reveals, it reveals an identification staying with the old time way. I want to say to you, we need to be earnestly contending for the faith. That means, it doesn't mean you have to be contentious, but it does mean you contend. We have run long enough. That's why we're in the mess, Brother Mark, we're in. Where are the Edgar and Willard Thomases? Where are Brother Hughes? Where are those men that stood and preached unashamedly? Uh, amen. And didn't care what anybody said. My God, we, 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 God help us. I'm so concerned. But I tell you what, I see these young boys over here. Some out of Brother Cody, some out of mine. And these young men here in this church and other churches that are believing in this, standing up and shouting. I thank God there's still hope. God's always going to have a remnant. But I don't, hey, hey. I can't even go back to the institution where I graduated 46 years ago. Hold me, oh, they'll take me back in, but I'd have to, I'd have to, I'd have to sign on the things that they used to believe against. Hey, man, I ain't changing on this King James Bible. Uh, you, you come along, hey, 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 you come along too late to tell me about critical uh, text and all this other text, Alexander, Sinaiticus, and Sina Sinaitica and everything else. Uh, Receptus. Conceptus or whatever else. Bless God, you've come along too late. Hey, amen. We, we, we've stopped defending our faith. That's why we're in the mess we're in. We've become man friendly instead of God faithfully. Hey, amen. Hey, hey, it requires continuing. I love, I love that word remaining. 
I didn't give you this phrase, but he said, Webster said, it implies that the one that's left behind is still continuing. We're not contentious. We're just continuing. We're staying with what got us saved. Brother Shane, we're staying with us, with what got us converted and made us change our lives. Reach down. Raise your hand back there, crossroads. Raise your hand. Raise your hand, crossroads. Stand up a minute. You know why we're going to keep contending? Because half those guys got saved in Faith Baptist Church and now they're preaching the gospel because God turned around a bunch of addicts and a bunch of drunkards that were on their way to hell. The old time religion still works when AAA won't work, when all the, the homes won't work. Thank God the gospel still works. Amen. Number three, it not only requires an affirmation to remain, it reveals an identification to remain. By the way, it does matter. Associations do matter. I saw yesterday, I, I try to be more selective when I do that Facebook. I, I, it took me a few years to even get on it. I, I, you know, I'm old school. I mean, I remember the party line telephones. Hey Amen. Somebody come up to me about 20 years ago and said, Brother Goodman, can I Google you? Brother Fleur, I wasn't from Florida, so I didn't know what that meant. I said, no, sir, I'm married. <laughs> I lived so far back in the country in North Carolina, we, we communicated this way and did smoke. Nicky, Nicky, Nicky. Uh, 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 that's on. Uh, that's Colonel Harvey on Andy Griffin. If you don't watch Andy Griffin, you don't read your Bible either. Hey, there's something wrong with you. Amen. Amen. May I say to you, it's a. Hey, it, it does matter who you associate with. It does matter who you. Um, one fella come up to me. I was catching on a little bit, but he come up to me and said, "Brother Goodman, do you Twitter?" I said, no, I don't, because I ain't a bird, amen. I don't tweet, amen. Hey, praise God. Hey, it results in separation. Paul remained, but Demas left. A bunch of them had left. There was a time even Mark left. I'm not, there was a time Barnabas even left. I didn't say they weren't good men, but they left. It got too tight. It does matter who's such. I'm not preaching second, third degree separation. I'm just preaching Bible separation. It's Bible. It's Bible. You invented, somebody else invented all those terms. It's Bible separation. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelief. Amen, amen. I'm not going to a prayer breakfast in Shelby, North Carolina with a woman preacher leading it. I, amen, wearing breeches so tight. If she sneezes, she'd blow her wig off. Come on, uh, amen. It results in separation. We're treading where the saints have trod. Hey, hey, we're where we've always been. We just believe in what the Bible's always said. See, what's happened, they've come along and removed the ancient landmarks. They've come along and decided, I don't want to be disrespectful, but I need to use this hymn book. Do I have permission to put it on the floor and I'm going to... I'm, I'm going to move it a little bit. But I, I don't want to offend nobody. It's one thing I don't want to do in life is offend anybody. <laughs> what they've done, let me get where everybody can see. This pulpit table ought to work. And what they've done is there's the landmarks. And when, the, when Solomon spoke of that, what would happen, they have, would have rocks or landmarks for borders. They didn't have survey like we do and the steel rods in the ground. But what they would do, they'd come by and a fellow's wanting to get more of your land. He would just come by and just bump it a little bit. He'd come by and he'd, he'd been a King James man. But then he said, but you know, there are, I will confess, 
there is a word or two that those uh, translators didn't get right. There's a word. There's a, this word here really don't mean what it says in the King James. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And, and those old hymns, they don't relate today. We need, we need, the preachers need to be separate, that need to be part of the crowd. This respect for a man instead of God, and they, we need to get rid of our ties and coats. I know it's not in the Bible. Don't, 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 don't you jerk at me. Don't, don't have a spaz attack. Don't look up here. Listen to me. But you go over there and read that Old Testament. And Aaron was to put things on there that identified him as the man of God and the priest. There needs to be a respect. It's not about the man, but it's about who we represent. We're not one of the boys. We're supposed to be men of God. We represent God to that crowd. And they moved it along. And they said, you know what? People won't come just with those old songs and those gospel songs. So what we've got to do with these churches, the sinner won't come in and feel comfortable with that beautiful building that has pictures of our Lord and Savior, has a cross up there. So what we need to do, we need to change the pews and the theater seats. We need to blacken the walls. We need to get the smoke machines out. Can I say, and what's happened? The landmark's been moved way over there. I want to say, somebody's got to dig in. Somebody's got to say, I'm not budging an inch. Thank God, thank God, he's, he's worth me staying in the lines. It requires an affirmation. It, require, it is, reveals an identification. If you remain, if you remain, it's going to result in a separation. I want to say, Number four, and I close, it responds in a determination. Back to 2 Timothy 4, just for a moment. He said, Timothy, when he started his chapter, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick in the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust will heap themselves teachers having itching ears. May I say to you, to preserve what we believe, you're going to have to be determined to do it. You're going to have to deny your emotions. You're going to have to stand against perhaps family. You're not going to be popular at some family reunions. You're going to have to be determined that you're not seeking the approval of the brethren. I, listen, I do have a motto. The older I get, I'm trying to meet new people and make new friends. I probably won't remember the name. Uh, uh, but, hey, I, I, I want to go out with friends. I would like for more than just my family show up at the funeral. I ain't even sure about all them coming. Somebody say amen right there. I know some of y'all's family, same way about you. Amen. I don't blame them. But what I'm saying is, hey, to preserve what we believe, we're going to have to preach it. Amen. Preach it. Amen. Preach it. Yeah. When they get tired of it, preach it. Yeah. When they get mad at it, preach it. Yeah. When they make fun of it, preach it. Yeah. When they're running away, preach it. Yeah. When they're running forward, preach it. Yeah. Preach it. Yeah. Preach it. Yeah. Preach it. Yeah. Preach it. Preach it, preach it, preach it. And then when you get done preaching it, preach some more. Preach it, preach it, preach it, preach it. Preach it. Amen. Practice it. A lot of guys quit preaching it. And a lot of them are, oh well. Shall I? A lot of them are recovering because they didn't want to repent. Recovering and criticizing others is easier than repenting. Boy, and I say that in love. There's been plenty of times this old man had to repent. There's old times I'd had to say, 
make me take the strongest medicine. But somewhere down the road, God has a restoration process. That as Paul told Philemon about Onesimus, he departed for a season that he would return forever. And they're not returning because they're not repenting. May I say to you, we're not changing masters. And by the way, we don't only preach it and, and practice it. We got to promote it. We got to promote it. Somebody said, you're preaching a version of this message about everywhere you go. Brother Mark, Brother Cody, well, I don't know how many days I got left. But I, I want to go out saluting Willard and Edgar Thomas and Dr. Preston Moore. I want to go out and say, thank y'all for what you taught me. I owe it to those old men of God, to Tom Malone's. I owe it to the B.R. Lakins. And I keep on preaching what those men preached to me when I was younger. We're not changing master's message, manual omission. It's still having done all to stand. I close with this. I close with this. I, I, I love American history. Thank you for these flags. My daddy, my daddy-in-law, my daddy-in-law fought through the jungles of the Philippines, Mindanao, so we could have the freedom we got. My daddy was in Japan for two years in the Army of Occupation. My stepdad fought in Korea. He's in heaven now. Who my mom married after my daddy died. I want to say there's been too much bloodshed. I want to say we just celebrated last week. Well, most Americans did. Our president and his cabinet did not celebrate the 77th anniversary of D-Day. Didn't even mention it. That just proves, it proves who's running the country. The same fellow that was president for eight years that wouldn't even put his hand over his heart during the Star Spangled Banner. Who's he talking about? Obama! I call our president Joe Obama. Amen. Say, so we're in trouble now. It don't matter. My lo our local sheriff is with me. Hey! But in World War II, there was a British commando unit that was assigned a task to get in a glider and be carried across the English Channel and the cords would be severed and they would glide in German occupied France to take a bridge at the River Orne which was a major thoroughfare that the intelligence community had decided that that was be, would be where the Germans would counterattack and be able to repel the landing invasion the next morning. It was vital to take that bridge at the River Orne and the General said to the Major, John Howard, he said, Sir, you have one task. That is to land your troops in that glider and take that bridge against insurmountable odds. You're going to drop you in the middle of the night and you've got to hold it until relieved. Hold until relieved. And they landed, they got out of that thing, they took that bridge with just a handful of commandos, they took that bridge, and then the fighting, sure enough, started. As the Germans, they could hear the big guns going off, as the panzer divisions now were coming their way. Daylight just came upon them. The, uh, the captain came to Major Howard, said, Major Howard, we fainted on the right side. He said, they've mounted a major offensive. We're not going to be able to hold. We're not going to be able to hold. And John Howard said in his mind, he remembered those, those words, hold until relieved. Hold until relieved. He said, we're going to, they said, Major, what are we going to do? He said, we're going to hold until relieved. And then in just about an hour, as the sun began to peep up, and just as it, the, the fog began to lift, somewhere in the background, they heard the sound of bagpipes. 
And here come that here came that Scottish division uh, of the Great Britain's army. It was uh, the colonel coming uh, to relieve. I want to say to you, dear friend, and when he got there and he patted him on the back and he said, well done, Major. You accomplished your mission. We didn't ask you to attack. We didn't ask you to take new land. We just told you to hold until we leave. May I say to you, dear child of God, we're holding up the blood-stained banner of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're holding up the manual. We're holding up the message. We are to hold until we leave, but we just won't be relieved. Thank God we're going to be retrieved because one day he's going to come with a shout with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. I want to hear well done, thou good and faithful servant. Hold until relieve and remain. Hallelujah. What a challenge, amen. What a challenge for every one of us, not only the preachers, but Everybody in the church house, all right? Thank you so much, preacher. Thank you so much. God bless you. I appreciate all these men preaching, don't you? I really do. God bless you. We have one more. We're going to give you five minutes to go to the restroom, stretch yourself. Brother Reigns, if you'll come play the piano maybe or somebody else even, take five minutes, not 20, take five, and our next preacher's coming in a little bit, all right? Shake hands with these preachers, all right? Shake hands with these preachers.
Let's get ready to come in from the front foyer. congregational song turn our next preacher loose in just a moment but uh we have several missionaries that are here and i want our missionaries of course please stay and eat with us everybody stay and eat with us but you missionaries you are more than welcome to give out prayer cards uh meet all these pastors i'm serious uh we don't mind it a bit we want to get to know who you are we want prayer cards we want you to feel free be at liberty to distribute your prayer cards to the pastors that are here, all right? Let's stand. We'll do a congregational song together. Let's take our hymnals, page 505. Love lift and pick. Let's do. If you're a missionary, you remain standing, all right? If you're a missionary, if you'll stand all over the building and let's get their recognition again and good and loud what, what, what your name, your church, the ministry you're going to. All right, right on the far right. This is a brand new brother. We just met him this year. Let's give him, a, let's give him an audience, all right? Go ahead. Yes, sir. God bless your heart. Thank you so much for being here, Brother Chris. Good. Amen. God bless you. Go right ahead, brother. And brother, how did you hear about the meeting? Uh, we uh, came here last year. Okay. Uh, last year was, uh, great, great, great. All the way from Maine. So you live in Alabama. Yes, sir. God bless your heart. Thank you. Go ahead, brother. Amen. Miss Pat Faulkner, stand up, Miss Pat. You're not a missionary, but can you quote us a Bible verse? I want you to hear this. Go ahead, Miss Pat. Yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> Can you tell what country they're both from? She got saved, her daughter got saved, husband got saved as a result of somebody being a witness in this church to her and her family. God bless you, Brother, Brother Kyle's family. Thank you, Miss Pat. I want you to see the England coronation. Listen, you two need to eat together. Y'all have something really in common. Oh, you hear me, old chap? You have something very in common. All right, all right. Go right ahead. Amen. So y'all are y'all are responsible for you're talking about 25 nationals over there. Yes. Each one of the nationals are pastoring a church yes. in the Philippines. Amen. That's great. God bless you. That's wonderful. That is wonderful. Isn't this great? Appreciate everything. And uh, I got this because it's the only thing I have to keep up with anything. And I'm only saying this not to rush the man. I'm not rushing you, brother Cody. I'm not. But I want them to know. I don't want them to go to Wendy's. If you go to Wendy's, it's a sin. Go to McDonald's, it's another sin. Go to Arby's, it's a third sin. And so you might end up in purgatory, all right? We, we have baked spaghetti and or chicken Alfredo. I'm like radio, I want both. I, mean, I want both, all right? Uh, baked spaghetti and or chicken Alfredo, garlic bread, salad bar, dessert, southern sweet iced tea. We're going to remain the same, southern sweet iced tea. All right, so don't leave. We'll get that in a little bit. Come on, Preacher Zorn. Uh, take the time you need. Preach to us. Brother Cody Zorn uh, was an evangelist for years, and now he's pastor, and we're glad to have him at our Jubilee. All right. Thank you, preacher. All right. God bless you. So good to be here this morning. I have been encouraged and helped and blessed, and man, I, I'll be honest with you, I feel kind of um, uh, overmatched and outnumbered and outgunned by the good preaching that we've heard, and to uh, have the opportunity just to stand with Brother Stroud and with Brother Goodman, two of my heroes, is absolutely a tremendous blessing this morning. It, it honestly is. I don't just say that. Um, it really, really is. I consider Preacher Goodman to be like a dad in the faith to me. Uh, I don't, I'm, I'm not saying that in a joking way, literally. I, I call him much. I lean on him a whole lot. And I appreciate his advice. He's been very helpful to me in the three and a half years that the Lord has let me pastor over in Rockwell. And uh, I just appreciate the opportunity to be here. I promise you, I'm not going to take much time. I'll be honest with you, the Holy Ghost convicted my heart sitting over there. God forbid that some pipsqueak gets up and takes more time than two seasoned men of God did. Uh, this man of God preached and preached the house down in 30 minutes. He did in 30, 35 minutes. I promise I'm not even going to take that much time, and, uh, and we're going to go eat. I want you to take your Bibles this morning, and I want you to go to the book of 2 Kings with me in chapter number 6. 2 Kings in chapter number 6. I really want to give you my heart this morning. Um, yesterday afternoon, the Lord began to stir in my soul this thought. Uh, yesterday afternoon, I'm going to be transparent with you. Can I be real just honest with you here this morning? Uh, I've never preached what I'm about to preach to you, and I don't ever do that in Jubilee. I like to preach, you know, everybody likes to get a message that they've preached before, and they kind of got her honed in and such as that. But I'm going to tell you how I come about this thing, Brother Cam. Yesterday afternoon, I was preaching revival down in Pickens, South Carolina for a friend of mine. And uh, we were closing out last night, walked in the room yesterday afternoon from eating. My son was reading his Bible. My son went down there with me. He's 12 years old. God's working his life. And I don't make him read his Bible. He chose to read his Bible. And he was sitting there reading his Bible. And uh, he looked at me and said, Dad, I got a question for you. I said, all right, son. He said, here in this text of Scripture, the Bible said these people left the place where they were staying at with Elisha. I said, yeah, that's what it said. And it said when they left that place, he said, Dad, look down there. They lost something when they left where they were. I said, they sure did, didn't they, son? I said, hang on just a minute. I'm going to get something on that. And I'll be honest, from then till now, the Lord has so burdened my heart and put something down in my soul that I've just got to give it to you this morning. After what Preacher Goodman just said, I I'll be honest with you. I, I, feel like, I feel like there are three generations in this meeting uh, the old man of God, the man of God that's bridging the gap, and then the young preacher this morning. And I, I, I feel like it is, it's almost our duty as young preachers to once again affirm what they say and what they believe. 
I believe we're in a bad situation today, Preacher Griffith, to where we've got old men saying the same stuff, but there are no young men coming up behind the gray heads saying the same thing to another generation so that they can grab a hold of it and so they know this is not odd. So the old men doesn't think we're not bailing ship, we're not jumping ship, we're not running off, but we're going to stand where they stood when they started tonight. We have some of our young preachers here today, and I want them to know this is still right. I want them to know it's not odd. I want them to know it's still fine to be this way, and it's still Bible to be this way. So I want you to look with me in 2 Kings chapter number 6. If you're there, say amen. Verse number 1, And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make us a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. And one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, Albeit I believe reluctantly, I will go. So he went with them, and when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place, and he cut down a stick and cast it in thither, and the iron didn't swim. Therefore said he, Take it up to thee. And he put out his hand and took it. I, I want to use verse number 1, but keep your Bibles open. We'll be preaching down through here this morning, where they said, Elisha, I want you to know something. The place where you've got us dwelling at, it's too straight for us. Elijah, the place where you hang out at, it's, it's too narrow. It's too rigid. It's too strict. Can I say this morning, people that say things like that, it's not that what we believe and preach is too strict for them. It's that it's too straight for them. There's a difference in something being too strict and something being too straight this morning. See, the Bible said in Philippians chapter 2, Paul said we're to shine as lights in the midst of a crooked, perverse generation. The problem with a lot of people today, it's not what we preach is too strict. It's because they have a bent towards being crooked. They have a bent towards worldliness. They have a bent towards carnality. They have a bent to live however they want, whatever they want, do whatever they want, hang out with whoever they want. And so the only way that they can miscategorize you and I is saying, well, they're just too strict. No, I would surmise to you this morning, it's that we're too straight. But was it not the Bible that said make straight paths for your feet this morning? Jesus said there's a broad way and there's a straight way this morning. I'd just like to go on record and say I still thank God for the straight way. I'm not planning on getting off the straight way. I'm not looking for a bypass. I'm not looking for an exit. I'm not looking for a spot to hop off. I thank God for my heritage. I thank God for my lineage. I thank God for a mama and a daddy that raised me in a straight Straight gun barrel Bible preaching church. I thank God for old men of God that preach straight to me. And I am what I am today because of the straightness of the way. So just for a few minutes, just for a few minutes, and I'm not going to take long, I want to preach on straying from the straight way. Or maybe we could preach this, things you lose when you stray from the straight way. See, there's, there's things that get lost Preacher Griffith, when they stray from the straight way, there are things that you cannot deny that when they leave where Elisha has had them dwelling, that they lose. And hear me this morning, I realize there's all kind of voices out there. There's all kind of voices that are coming out from in places like this. And the voices say there's nothing wrong with a new way. There's nothing wrong with a new method. There's nothing wrong with a new approach. May I say this morning, there's nothing wrong with a straight way. It's not broke. It doesn't need fixing. I know what people say. They say, well, we knew somebody in one of your churches that they molested some little girl. We know somebody that went off with somebody, and they need to be prosecuted. They need to be dealt with. I get all that stuff. I ain't against that. They say, well, we know somebody at one of your churches that did something. They lied to somebody. They mishandled money. I get all that, and they'll be dealt with. But there's nothing wrong with the message. There's nothing wrong with the man Christ Jesus. There's nothing wrong with the methods this morning. The straight way is still the right way this morning. 
still, still right and say, what, what do we lose? What do we lose when we stray from the straight way? Can I say the first thing we lose is we lose the crowd we were with. Oh, you may gain a new crowd, but you're going to lose the crowd that you were with. Do you notice here in the text? It is Elisha that says, "I'm not going. I'm not going down there." Uh, Elisha says, "Go ye. If you want to go, if you want to go, get you a new way. Knock yourself out. But I, I'm just going to stay right here." And the Bible said they keep urging him, preacher Goodman. They keep pressing on him until finally he reluctantly goes with him. Let me pause right here and say this. I'm not throwing shade on Elisha, but I would like to say something to all the old men of God in the building. Please stay where you stood when you. Stood started because when you start dipping your colors you make all of us look bad this morning please please for the sake of me and this generation over here we need we don't need you to start inching toward the left start moving we need we need you to keep hanging out where you've always hung out so that we can follow in the same way I'll be honest it's discouraging me watching old men that preach what I'm preaching this morning and now they're leaving it behind I'm not talking about young men I'm talking about old men taking Baptists off their sign I'm talking about old men yoking up with tongues flappers and preaching for people who don't even use the King James Bible and they used to stand where we stand and now they're nowhere to be found. Brother, don't go with them. We still need what you got. What do you lose? You lose the crowd that you're with. I know what they say. This is what they say, Preacher Stroud. This is what the sons of the prophets were saying. They say, well, we can't build a ministry hanging out with that old straight guy, Elisha. I mean, Elisha, you got to be so straight. I mean, Elisha, you ain't got to cuss people out and make bears eat them. I mean, that's just a little straight, Elisha. Ain't no sense in blasting little children out and letting bears come eat them. That's just too straight for us, Elisha. When's the last time? What? You think you think you got any preachers today with any guts like that? Now, did you notice when they decided to leave Elisha, Brother Sean, this is something, when they decided to leave Elisha and leave the straight way, it's right after somebody gets infected with a picture of sin. Somebody got infected with leprosy in chapter 5. It leads right up to chapter 6. Look at it. They got infected with sin, and Elisha kicked them out. And when Elisha run out, the guy that had been infected with sin, the first thing these sons of the prophets say is, you're just too straight for us. You just, you, you, you don't got enough, you don't have enough compassion. You don't have enough love. Yeah, here's what Elisha knows. If Elisha doesn't deal with Gehazi, it'll infect everybody. It'll get on everybody this morning. Leprosy's contagious. And if Elisha doesn't run Gehazi off, all the sons of the prophets and their families and their children, everybody gets infected. There ain't nothing, there ain't nothing wrong with the straight way that still deals with sin. Nothing wrong with a straight way that still deals in judgment. There's nothing wrong with that. It still works. And here's what they say. Here's what they say. Well, the Elishas with that kind of straight way, they can't build a ministry anymore. You can't build a crowd anymore. Well, I'd like to ask this. Go read about the sons of the prophets. Tell me anything they ever did in the scripture. Tell me anything. They, they, didn't, they don't never do a blessed thing for God. I'm talking about search the sons of the prophets. There might be one in my studies that had any kind of grit and he ends up disobeying the word of the Lord because an old man lied to him and he got ate up by a lion. The sons of the prophets add up to zero in the scriptures. But the old man that stayed in the straight way, Man, he's raising, he raising people from the dead. He's got a mantle from another world. He's knocking whole armies into blindness. Brother, he's got the touch of God on him. I tell you this, I'd rather lose that crowd that's running to the Broadway and hang out with an old man with a mantle that knows God and walks with God and got a touch from God any day of my life. You're going to lose the crowd you were with. I'll tell you something about, I'll tell you something about this crowd. Did, look, 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 look with me. Hold your place in chapter 5 or chapter 6 there. Go to chapter 2. Look at something about this crowd. These sons of the prophets that are leaving the straight way. Notice they don't have any commitment. Look at chapter 2 and verse number 7. Elisha and Elijah are walking along. And Elijah's about to get taken from the presence of Elisha and the royal chariot up to glory 
And watch what the Bible said in verse number 6. Elisha said unto him, Terry, I pray thee here. For the Lord hath sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. This old boy's got some commitment. See, I'll tell you, that's one thing they don't like about the straight way. There's some commitment in the straight way. I mean, commitment where you're all in this morning. And look at what they did. Watch, watch verse 7. Don't miss it. Here's, watch how uncommitted they are. And 50 men of the sons of the prophets went, and real skeptical-like, real snarky-like, and stood to view afar off. I mean, I wonder to, my, I wonder to myself, preacher, preacher Jeff Griffith, how come, how come these sons of the prophets didn't realize and say, bless God Almighty, we're going with him too. It ain't like Elijah said they couldn't go. If they'd have wanted to, they could have went. I tell you the problem, they didn't want to. Why? They had no commitment. We just want to kind of, we want to kind of say, you know, that we're in. But I mean, crossing the Jordan and going over there to see, you know, a chariot come by and grab up. I mean, you know, that's just, now we're going a little extreme with this thing. You know, we want to act like we're, we're in, but still kind of hang out out here. I, I, I want to tell you something, sister. We don't, we don't need any more half in, half out ladies in the church. We need some ladies. I ain't talking about just preachers. I'm talking about we need some ladies in the church that will raise another young generation of ladies for God and show them what way he's all the way in, that it's all right to dress right. It's all right to be a wife that guides the house and raises children and leads a family for God. It's all right to be in submission to your husband. It's all right to serve God. It's all right to raise your hand in worship. It's all right to, hey, it's still right. We need some folk that'll just say I'm committed they didn't have no commitment not only didn't have no commitment I find they also had all kinds of contradictions talk about this crowd look at the crowd they got they lost the crowd they was with look at the crowd they're in now look at chapter 2 verse 16 chapter 2 verse 16 Elisha comes back Elijah's done went up to heaven in the whirlwind Elisha comes back watch verse 16 of chapter 2 they said unto him, Behold, now there be with thy servants fifty strong men. Let them go, we pray thee, and seek thy master, lest peradventure the Spirit of the Lord hath taken him up, cast him upon some mountain or into some valley. And he said, You shall not sin. I mean, how stupid does that sound? Does that not sound stupid to anybody else? Here these idiots walk up to Elisha and say, Hey, we think the Spirit of God, we think the Holy Ghost picked Elijah up and chunked him down somewhere. How stupid are you? And the preacher said, man, don't run off for that. That's dumb. Why would you run off? Do you, can't you see through this? Can't you see how dumb this is? Why y'all all fixing to take off? Don't go. Verse 17, and they urged him till he was ashamed. And he said, fine, go on ahead, knock yourself out, sin. They sent therefore 50 men and saw three days, but they found him not. And when they came again to him, here's what preacher was preaching on a minute ago, folk that don't want to repent. See, they run off after some new thing, chasing some new thing that we've already told them for years is stupid. It's lunacy. It's going to leave you empty beside the road. Here's why they don't get right, because they have to come back and hear this. When they came again to him, for he tarried at Jericho, he said unto them, did I not say unto you, go not? I, I told you it wouldn't work out. I'm telling you all this afternoon, I, listen, I'm, I'm a 30, think of me, 37-year-old man, and so I got a lot of my age group in here this morning. Listen to me. All this new stuff that's coming, it, it, you're going to leave you empty beside the road. We told you, we told you, they told us, and I'm telling you, it doesn't work out the straight way. It's still the right way this morning. And everybody's looking for something new. Well, man, I tell you, I think the Spirit of God doesn't let me go do that. I think the Spirit of God, show me something in the Bible on that. Let me back up and say this about just a minute ago, uh, saying about the sons of the prophets never build anything. Elisha has. All, all this new crowd, preacher Fallure, this is, this is one of their main drawing cards. Well, you can't build a church anymore preaching like Brother Zorn's preaching this morning, like Brother Goodman preaching, like Brother Stroud's preaching. I dare you to come over to 11360 Old Concord Road, Rockwell, North Carolina on Sunday morning and see what God's doing. 
three and a half years ago, God planted me in that place. Brother, they just barely paid the bills. Had about 50 people on Sunday morning. Come this Sunday morning, there'll be about 225 people in there shouting, running the aisles, having a big time, and doing it in the right way. I'm talking about dress right, looking right, spitting my... I mean, walking... Look, it still works. People still want to hear the truth. People still like the truth. I've been to that man of God's church. They'll give him hell, and they'll say, you can't build a church like Preacher Goodman preaches. Anybody ever been to Faith Baptist Church? It's all like Donkey Kong. I don't come here on a regular basis, but I watch your choir all the time and some of you preaching. It still works around here. They just built a new building over there, didn't you? It's still working. Brother Bachman's over here. They're still adding folk to the church. He's still preaching the old King James Bible. He's still ripping and snorting and raring. And it's still growing. It still works. It still works. It can, it can still grow something. As a matter of fact, most of these sons of the prophets that are running off to new, modern, and contemporary, brother, listen to me. There's only a handful, there's only a scant handful that they hold up as their poster boys to say, see, their churches are growing. But the rank and file, by and large, are dying. They're dead. They're dead. They got all the lights and all the pop, but brother, they ain't got full buildings. You know what they got? They buy a little bitty old theater somewhere that can seat about 35 people, and they pack 35 out, and they think they've really done something. Yeah, yeah, and, and they make it look like, man, we got this mega ministry going. No, you don't. You're a cheap plastic knockoff of what your predecessors got. You're a cheap knockoff. You're a cheap imitation of what you want to be this morning. Young men, you don't got to sell out to build a crowd. You don't got to sell out to build a church. You can stay straight, live straight, preach straight, and God still bless it. I say you lose, you lose the crowds you're with. I'm done. I'm going to preach about 15 minutes. I think we'll be through. Not only what do you lose when you leave the straight way, you lose the crowd you're with. I'll tell you what else you lose. You lose clarity. You lose clarity. So what do you mean clarity? Well, Preacher Griffith had said in the text, the place where they were dwelling was straight. In other words, there was no doubt where the boundaries was, the markers was, the landmarks. Brother Gene, it was easily discernible. But watch where they come to. Look at verse number four of chapter six. Chapter four, and, and, or, or, uh, excuse me, chapter six, verse four. Verse four of chapter six said, so he went with them and they came to Jordan. When they came to Jordan, watch what they're having to do. Having to clear stuff out. They cut down wood. I tell, I'll tell you why people like to leave the straight way. Listen, please don't miss this. It's so they can make their own boundaries. See, Brother Zach, when they showed up at this new place, there ain't no discernible boundary. So, so preacher reigns, they're just making new boundaries. They're cutting their own way out. They're not hanging out where the boundaries have already been marked out by the previous preachers. No. They're out, they're out taking axes and they're trying to cut down brand new boundaries. And when they get to somewhere, they say, this is what they say, they say, well, is this too far? Nah. What's your standard for saying whether it's too far or not? We just feel like it ain't too far. <laughs> we just, there no, there's no discernment whatsoever of what's too far. How far do we go? Let me say this. Listen to what I'm fixing to tell you. This generation now that have moved far left of where we are, Please don't miss this. If their children in the next generation move left of them and their children move left of them, brother, in about two generations, they'll be straight up atheists and infidels. Y'all, I, I want to go ahead and put a, can I put a plug in here for something just a minute? Let me put a, I'm going to put a plug in here. August the 14th at 1 o'clock at the church I pastor, we are having, as far as I know, one of the first that I've ever known of, at least in this area, King James Bible debate. We got Brother Mitchkin up that's a King James Bible scholar coming in and debating one of the recovering fundamentalists. Now listen to me. I'm talking about, brother, we're going to have it set up. We're having a, just, I'm, I'm going to take myself out of ask the questions, and I want everybody to come to can. It's a Saturday, August 14th at 1 o'clock. I'm not doing this to try and debate should we use the King James or not. I want our church to see how muddy the waters get when you start changing the Word of God. 
Brother, you start backing up just a little bit. Now I'm telling you, there's nowhere that you stop at. There's no weeds that you won't wind up in. You wind up there morally. You wind up in the weeds maritally. You wind up in the weeds with your message. You wind up in the weeds with your music. The whole thing goes out the window. I mean, Preacher Rains, where, 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 where's the stopping point at on this thing, Brother Daniel? I mean, now if it's all right, if it's all right to make our music sound just like R&B and hip-hop and rap, and it's all right to have young ladies on the platform with skirts and shorts hiked up to their thigh, y'all listen to me, there's no way that a young boy sitting on the front row checking out the thighs of some little girl where the dress just barely covers the essentials, there's no way their mind's on Jesus. Let me go a step further. There ain't no way any grown man, any grown man old goat pervert sitting on the pew has his mind on Jesus. So where do we stop at this thing? You know, this is what they all say, Brother Zach. They all say this. We don't like your standards. You got standards. Well, y'all got standards too. Don't try and beguile unstable souls with your garbage. Acting like you ain't got standards. You got a standard. Oh, no, we don't got standards. We don't believe all that dress standard. Okay, okay. What if one of your ladies wants to get up on the platform and sing in a two-piece bikini? Yeah. And some dude wants to sing on your platform in a pair of shorts and no shirt on? Yeah. Well, no, no, we couldn't do that. Why? You, you legalist? Yeah. Got standards? Yeah. You a daggone Pharisee? Yeah. No, see, they got some. They just don't like the straight ones. Yeah. They like them when they get edgy and crooked and out the way. There's absolutely no clarity. You know why I like this? You know why I like preaching like that and preaching like that this morning? We ain't walking out of here saying, where's the boundaries at? Where can we run? No, sir. We can see them marked out. They're just as clear as they can be. They're defined real good. And I like being in a place where the boundary is straight this morning. I don't like going to a church we have to question all the boundaries and where they're at. I like being in a place I can see it all marked out. I'm, I'm, I'm through. What do you lose? What do you lose when you leave the straight way? Well, you lose the crowd you were with. You lose clarity. And then lastly, obviously, in the text, you lose your cutting edge. You lose your cutting edge. You, 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 you've preached this before. I'll, I'll just bump this and quit because you've been to God preach this so many times better than I could. But verse 5 and verse 6, you see what happens. Brother David, they're cutting down trees and the axe head comes off. They lose, they lose their edge. You know all they're doing? They're just making noise. But they have no sharpness to their work. I'm going to tell, tell, tell you what leaving the straight way has done is taken the sharpness out of us. We're living in a generation. I, I, I despise what they're doing to our generation. They are, they are, they are trying to feminize our, boy, our, our boys, and they're trying to masculinize our girls. And, brother, there is nothing masculine about most modern-day preaching that I'm hearing coming up. It doesn't sound manly. It doesn't look manly. Can I tell you after studying 2 Corinthians and teaching it to our church, Paul said his preaching, brother Andrew, had four elements to it. Check it out for yourself. Paul said my preaching had four elements to it that people said about his preaching. 2 Corinthians 3, he said, we use great plainness of speech. He said my preaching was plain. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, he said over there, he said, I'm rude in speech. Or that's chapter 11, excuse me. He said, I'm rude in speech, yet not in knowledge. Chapter 13, he said his preaching was with sharpness. There's one more right now. I can't remember. It's in chapter number 10. Oh, that's what he said. He said his bodily presence is weak and his speech is contemptible. He said my four elements to preaching was plainness, contemptibleness, rudeness, and sharpness. Per your example and my example in the New Testament, he said, follow me as I follow Christ. Amen. All these, all these jack legs saying, you're not to follow a man, you're not to follow a man. Paul said, follow him. Yeah. The Bible said, follow them who through faith and patience inherit the promise. There's nothing wrong with following a man as long as the man's following God. Yeah. Now, I'll tell you what we've done. We've lost our cutting edge. 
we, we've lost our sharpness in our preaching. We've lost the power of God to prick the hearts when we go to our services. I'm done right here, but I'm going to tell you something. You listen to what I'm telling you. Sons of the prophets never made more prophets. I'm going to tell you what made people want to become a son of the prophet, Elijah and Elisha. Yeah. The sons of the prophets simply poached their young men. Mark this down. Brother Sean, this is, this is the God's honest truth. My conscience bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, I lie not. These, these modern, contemporary, recovering whatevers, they are not producing preachers. They're not getting called to preach. They never have young men getting called to preach. Why? They don't got nothing young men want. There's no sharpness. There's no power. There's no authority. There's no unction of the Holy Ghost. Another generation doesn't want it. You say, well, why then are some of these guys, why, why they got young preachers with them? Because they got called to preach under people like me. Like these boys over here. And then they poached them out from under us. Because they come by and say, well, your pastor is not real educated. All he does is holler and scream and spit and sweat. Your, 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 your pastor is not real intellectual. You, you, your pastor is not very loving. And nothing could be further from the blessed truth. I'm talking about, friend, it, it, I love what Preacher Goodman preached. Brother Stroud hit it right off the bat this morning. I'm not looking to dip my colors, change my colors. I'm looking to establish the straight way, stay in the straight way, walk in the straight way. I want to raise my children in the straight way. I'm glad I got a wife that backs me up in the straight way. She's not pulling that way and I'm pulling this way. We're walking in the, glory to God, we're walking in the straight way together and enjoying it and having the time of our lives today. Preacher, I'm, preacher, I'm through. I'm going I'm to I'm walk down. You walk up. I'm through. I wonder today, please. The, it's been the theme of the morning. It's been the theme of the morning. I couldn't get this off my heart. That man God preached it. He hit it right when he got up here this morning. Please, this morning, make your mind up. I'm not looking to leave the straight way. I'm not looking to leave a way that gets a little crooked and edgy. Get a little edgy in my music, a little edgy in my dress. Get a little edgy in my friends. No, no, no. I'm just looking to get right in the straight way. What's wrong with the straight way? Nothing. Nothing is wrong with it. And I don't want to lose anything. That Bible said, John said, see that you lose not the things you've gained. Don't, I don't want to lose my reward. I want to hang on to it. I want to remain. Lord of God. Father, I pray you'd bless this simple little message from the Word of God. God, use it in somebody's life and use it in somebody's heart. I thank you for this place. God, the Mountain View Baptist Church has stayed in the straight way for as long as I've been alive, God. Heard of it all my life and now have an opportunity, what an honor, to preach in this dear brother's pulpit. God, and Lord, preach to these two preachers, Lord, that are my heroes. Thank you for the straight way that they stand in. God, help us to stay in a straight way. Not step out of the way. Not compromise on the way, but just stay in the straight way this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Preacher, it's yours. He's hurrying. I, I didn't tell him to hurry. I really didn't. I hope I didn't put no pressure on you. But uh, Brother Zorn, if it's all right with you, and I never do this, I don't, I'm not trying to add. I want to show you something. Remember what they lost? Watch who told them where to get it. So they went with them, and when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one felling a beam, the axe, and as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. Who tells them how to recover what they just lost? And the man of God said, Elijah. He walked up, he said, where did it fall? And he said, where fell it? And he showed him a tree, the place. He cut, he, the man of God, cut down a stick and cast it in thither and the iron did swim. Who, who got them back? where they needed to be to recover what they lost. The same man of God that they didn't want to be like around to begin with. Look at it. I'm not at it. I don't do that. But I couldn't, I couldn't help when you was closing. I thought, I've got to make sure about this. 
It wasn't one of the sons of the prophets that said, oh, it fell right there in the water. And it wasn't one of the sons of the prophets that said, let's cut a tree and that represents a cross. Let's get it back. It was the man of God. The one that was in the straight way. I couldn't help but think of these messages this morning and how much pressure is on probably about every pastor in here when we hear and see what's going on that maybe the devil or the flesh or former friends put pressure on God's men you know, change this, change that, give this up go that route, hey friend we don't want to go that route we have no plans to go that route if what we're doing here at Mountain View Baptist Church is not going to build the ministry, and Brother Zorn, I don't know what else to do. I, and you know what? I have no desire to try anything else. We want to love people. We want to reach them. We want to go after them. And we're going to do all that. We're going to do all that. But I'll tell you what. We're not going to throw the straight way out the door. You can't. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. I'm glad my children got to hear this this morning. And I've said this in this pulpit. I'm going to let you go. We're going to go eat. And I know you'll say the same thing. The way you brought yours up and the way I brought ours up, it hadn't hurt them one bit. Had it? it hadn't hurt them one bit. And I want ours to bring theirs up like we brought them up. That's what works. Amen, everybody? All right. Again, if you go out to eat lunch, you probably just sinned against God. <laughs> we want you to stay. We spend a lot of money. We don't care. We don't care. We really don't. God's given it to us. We bought a bunch of food. We need you people to go eat it, okay? We need you to go eat it. Let's stand all over the building. Uh, we're going to ask a blessing here. Landon, text them real quick. I know everybody text. Tell them we're asking the blessing on this side of the road, and then when we, when we get there, we'll be ready to eat. All right. I want to get our nighttime preacher to come down here. I love him. Brother Floor. I love you so much. I want you to come down here. He uh, just got in from Knoxville. He'll be preaching tonight. Dr. Joe Arthur will be preaching tonight. We're starting at 7. We'd love to have all of you come back tonight. We'd love to have all of you. Preacher, so good to see you. We're praying for you tonight. Would you ask the blessing on today's meal, please, sir? Our Heavenly Father, we're so grateful to, this morning to be in this place and the spirit and the preaching of the Word of God. Thank you for it. Thank you, Lord, for this meeting and this church and the burden in having it. I pray that your blessing will be on the services that are to come. Thank you for the food. Blessed and nourished in our bodies, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.